A reading from Hebrews. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen is, was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Through this, he received approval as righteous, God himself giving approval to his gifts. He died, but through his faith, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For it was attested before he was taken away that he had pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Do not be afraid, little flock, because it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, is there your heart will also be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. 
You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and prudent manager whom his master will put in charge of his slaves to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and if he begins to beat the other slaves, men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him <laughs> and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him in with the unfaithful. That slave who put him with the unfaithful, that slave who knew what his master wanted but did not prepare himself or do what was wanted will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating, will receive a light beating. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. The Gospel of the Lord. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. There's a theme in today's two readings that is more subtle in the Gospel reading, but very overt in the reading from Hebrews. And the theme is faith or faithfulness. And it's interesting because our culture is not always comfortable with the word faith as much as they are with religion or being religious or spiritual and spirituality. Our culture is very comfortable with those words because religion and religious are kind of nondescript, as is spirit and spirituality. What's interesting is scripture uses the word faith many times more than the word religious or the word spiritual or spirituality in describing someone. For example, Scripture hundreds of times will use the term faith or faithful or faithfulness with regards to the Lord, his faithfulness, but also with regard to his people. The word religion or religious, however, you're going to find in description of people well under 100 times, somewhere around 20 or 30. I know because I read the Bible through last night and counted. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, there's such a thing as a concordance, which is very convenient. You just kind of look and add them up. And then the word spirituality or spiritual in reference to people is even less than that. Now, why is that? It's because faith is a clear word. It's a declaration of someone's trust in the Lord. And if you really understand scripture, it's more than just trust, it's a love of the Lord. Which is why when faith is described in various places throughout the scriptures, you'll see how the person who with faith or by faith, as you see in Hebrews 11 over and over again, in fact, Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. It's these people who are known throughout scripture as being faithful men and women. People who sought the Lord, who sought his will, sought his word, sought to be faithful in their following of him and grow in a relationship with him. Not just about religion or religious. I mean, there's a lot of things that I do religiously, and you do too. I shower religiously and brush my teeth religiously, and you can thank God for that, okay? <laughs> I play golf religiously Thursday afternoons. Trust me, you have to be dying in order to get me off the course, okay? 
And so the reality is it's there are things we do in our lives religiously, which is why it's a safe word. And a religion is more of a habit or a practice. Now, some people think of their faith as a religion. But even if you do, it's got to be more than habit or practice or something that you do, through, do and go, just go through the motions. Because faith is meant to be alive. It's meant to be a relationship. And when it comes to spirituality, some of you heard me say this a few months ago. When people say they're spiritual, you need to understand it's like saying I'm a human being. Because everyone is created with a spirit. So when someone says to you, I'm spiritual, what does that mean? Of course you're spiritual. God created you. You're a human being. You have an eternal part of who you are. Yes, you're spiritual. And if I'm feeling feisty, I'll say Satan is spiritual. People love when you do that, don't they? <laughs> so the reality is, is that every being, human, divine, that God has created is spiritual. The question is, what are you doing with your spirit? And if you're religious, how are you practicing that? What is the discipline of your life that reveals more than just religion or religiosity, but faith and a faithfulness? That you're really seeking after the Lord, that you're really seeking his heart and mind, that you're really seeking to love him with the whole of your being, which is what our faith is meant to be about. And that's why you see these saints in the Old Testament that trusted in God and trusted in the promises of God were seeking after him to see what he had for them. And they wanted to hear his word. And they wanted to hear from him. And they wanted to worship him. And if we really understand what faith is, when scripture talks about faith, saving faith, faith being the gospel itself, Romans 5, that faith is more than just acknowledgement, more than this head knowledge, that Jesus sometimes would even contrast faith, for example, with the Pharisees and Sadducees, that they missed the boat on faith and what faith was meant to be. More than just praxis. More than just going through these actions and motions. More than just legalism. And when he talked to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, that they got their faith wrong. Now, people today would be loath to say that. Loath to hear that. And yet the reality is some people are wrong. Because John 4 talks about a true faith. And a true faith in a true God. A God who is faithful. A God who is trustworthy. A God who loves us, which is why he sent his son. And so when we talk about faith, faith is seeking to know him. Seeking to trust him. Seeking to love him. Seeking to follow him. That's what faith is. And that's what we talk about, what we are as Christians. That we are seeking faith, that we are seeking to be faithful. And those in the Old Testament trusting in the promises of God, being fulfilled by Jesus Christ in the cross and the resurrection. That they trusted him and trusted him to his promises. That he promises to be faithful. And so we need to understand what faith really is all about. And the way Hebrews begins in talking about faith, it says, now faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, things not seen. Things hoped for, assurance. Do you have assurance in your faith? I mean, do you really have assurance in your faith? Some people will often say something like, I hope so, but the hope almost seems empty. The hope almost seems like pie in the sky, or maybe, that kind of hope. But when scripture talks about the assurance of faith, there's this absolute confidence. 
absolute confidence. I mean, we all want to be assured. We all want to know. And not just pie in the sky, not just this empty promise. We want to know, we want the assurance of God. And sometimes faith is elusive for some people. But we need to understand that faith in Scripture is never really defined. It's like the Holy Spirit who is like the wind, as Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3. That you can't always see faith per se. But you can see the results of faith. You can see the impact of faith. You can see how faith directs and changes one's life. If you really understand that faith really is meant to be tangible. It's kind of like love. Love sometimes is hard to define exactly. But when you see love, when you experience love, you know it. It's the same idea. They're all invisible to the naked eye. They're all invisible to the physical eye. But the results are visible. And when we understand the results, the impact on our hearts and lives then we are assured, and we have a hope. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt, or you know people that have said, things seem hopeless? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, where things seem hopeless. Or you will say that something is hopeless. Or you're praying for someone, and the situation seems hopeless. I don't know how you go through life Always being hopeless. Because I always have hope. Because there's always God and the power of God. That scripture would say, for example, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. That we are not like those who have no hope. And he's referring to the Gentiles. He's referring to people of the world. Because we always have hope. Because we always have the Lord. And hope doesn't always get answered the way we hope it will. But our hope is eternal. And that's what we also have to keep in mind. That when we hope in the Lord, it's not just in this life, it's for eternal life. And so we always have hope. And we can always hold on to that hope. You know, it's interesting, 1 Corinthians 13. It, scripture says in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, that we see in a glass darkly. See, hope in this life is not always absolutely clear. When we hope, we don't know exactly how things are going to work out. We have the assurance because we trust the Lord, but we don't know exactly how it's going to work out. But we continue to hope. And then 1 Corinthians 13 goes on to say at the end, Faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why? Because faith is meant to get us through this life. We trust the Lord. We seek the Lord. The Lord guides us. The Lord empowers us. The Lord blesses us to get through this life. And we trust him and we grow in the knowledge and love of him. That's faith. Hope. Hope also gets us through this life. Because there are situations at times that to the world would seem hopeless. But to us, we always have hope because we always have the Lord. But those both are only meant to get us through this life. When we see the Lord face, face to face in eternity, you don't need faith, faith anymore. He's there. You don't need hope anymore because you see physically. That's why Jesus would say to Thomas, who people love to say is doubting Thomas, You believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. Physically, we have not seen Jesus on the cross. Physically, we have not seen Jesus risen from the dead. We see through eyes of faith that brings us the assurance, that convinces us of hope, and we trust him. But we are the ones who are blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen physically, but believe there is faith. 
There is why we have assurance. There is why we have hope. Because we trust him. Then Hebrews 11 goes on to, in chapter 11, verse 6. And I remember when I first read this, I kind of questioned it, and I kind of pondered it, and I kind of wrestled with it a little bit. Without faith, we cannot please God. Now, what does that mean exactly? What that means is that when we do what we do, if we're not walking with the Lord, if we're not seeking the Lord, it doesn't mean that we're not doing good things. Because we can do good things without faith. We can love people without faith. We can love people and do things for those people without faith. But ultimately, whose will are we following? And who gets the reward for the good things that we do? We do. Because other people think we're so wonderful. But we're not giving God the glory. Other people think we're special. Sometimes we do it for our own satisfaction. Sometimes we do it for our own fulfillment. Sometimes we do it because love almost demands it. But we're not pleasing the Lord. We're not seeking his glory. We're pleasing ourselves. When, when we walk by faith... When we respond with that faith, we are satisfied, we are blessed, we are a blessing to others, and we glorify him. See, sometimes people have a hard time with the whole notion and idea of faith because we want everything to be about us. And it's not. It's about him. When we walk by faith, we're constantly seeking him. We're seeking to love him with the whole of our being. And by that love and through that love and the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we can bless people in a multitude of ways because that's how God operates. In his strength, in his power, in his ability to love through us in ways we can't. We may be willful in what we want to do, but we lack the strength to do everything we need to do. We need his power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit shaping our will, changing us, and using us. That's what we need, especially when we run out. You know, as we get toward the end of Hebrews 11, we read of other saints, if you will, of the Old Testament who trusted the Lord and trusted in the promises of the Lord. Who gave us examples of what it means to be faithful even when our eyes don't reveal what it is that God's going to do. And we see that through these various saints that are listed in Hebrews 11. And then you get to Hebrews 12.1. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. He's talking about these people. And what is a witness? A witness is someone who experiences what it is that they testify about, that they talk about. It's kind of like a courtroom scene. The conviction of things not seen. That's what scripture says. The conviction. Do you have that conviction? What's a, conf a convict? A convict is someone that there's evidence. A convict is there's no question about what they've done. The convict has a result of what it is they have done. And when we have the conviction, the conviction, of what we have not seen. Then we have that assurance. Then we have that hope. Then we become a part of the cloud of witnesses. That's God's desire for our lives. That there is evidence in our life. And we have the cloud of witnesses that participate in the courtroom scene. 
that by that, their experience and by their words, they encourage us. They bless us. They inspire us by their faith. And the cloud of witnesses existed in the Old Testament, the people that we see walked with the Lord, who trusted in his promises, who God spoke to, which is how we have the word of the Lord, whose lives were directed by the Lord and they sought to please him. Were they perfect? No, of course not. No one outside of Jesus was perfect. But by their lives given over to him, they knew his presence. They knew his strength. They knew his love. They knew his peace. And they walked by faith. And then you get to the New Testament and we have a new wave of witnesses. We have the apostles. We have the disciples. We have those who have the experience of the cross and the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses for us. And then you look down through history and there are witness after witness of people that the Lord used throughout history. That their lives modeled a life of faithfulness. And now, you are meant to be part of the cloud of witnesses. You are meant to be one who is part of that group of people that can testify, which is what a witness does, to the Lord working in their life because they've experienced it. That's what a witness does. That's what we are meant to be. You know, we talk a lot in our culture about a cloud, but it has more to do with the internet. And lots of people are part of the cloud in the internet. And it's a cloudy day out there, so we talk about clouds with the weather. But the cloud that we need to be aware of is the cloud of witness. The cloud of witnesses. Of which we are meant to be a part of. Because by our lives, we've experienced the Lord by faith. We walk by faith. We know the presence and power and love of the Lord. We're convinced, assured, convicted of the cross and the resurrection and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we become part of the cloud of witnesses. Are you a part of the cloud? Let's pray. Lord, our culture is so confused about the whole notion and idea of faith. People talk about religion and people talk about spirituality. And how our culture, our culture by and large, might have people who are religious who are involved in various religions, but who have lost sight of faith, the true faith, saving faith, the faith of the gospel, the faith found in and through Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray this day that we would understand the gift of faith. By the cross of Christ, by the power of the resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would learn more and more what it means to follow you, to seek you, to seek you through your word, through your promises, by the Holy Spirit working in us. Lord, help us to be confident, to be convicted, to be assured. Help us to grow in the knowledge and love of you daily. That we might more and more be your witnesses in a world that desperately needs the promise of faith, the promise of hope, and your love. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.